And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. So Becca Lloyd is joining us. Becca Lloyd is adjunct faculty at Brigham Young University in art history. She is a lifetime Utah resident and a frequent visitor of the acclaimed Spiral Jetty. And she loves to share um, her knowledge and information about the Spiral Jetty. You can also find her on Instagram. I'm gonna put her handle in the chat. It's Bower Bird Art Tours, and that is on Instagram. So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn the time over to Becca. Becca, please take us away. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm thrilled to share uh, this information and more than that, uh, kind of the heart of the spiral jetty. I was telling Nissa earlier, um, as a child growing up in Salt Lake, I didn't ever make the trip out to the spiral jetty as it is purposefully hard to get to. Um, and now uh, at, after a lifetime of studying art history um, and feeling the call, my particular interest is to be an ambassador of art to those of you in the back of the museum who are wondering why you paid your admission costs to see you know, this abstract art or this thing that's so hard to understand. So I'm hoping tonight uh, to help you uh, not only uh, learn information, but to see a personal connection and a reason to care about this very uh, impactful object from uh, art history and something that in my introductory art history classes I teach every time we talk about 20th century uh, earthworks. Uh, so let's start at the beginning and look at the object itself. See. Okay, so thanks to in advance to Ron Brown, he is a photographer who actually got in touch with me when he learned about uh, my lecture tonight and he has some incredible aerial and uh, ground photos that he is letting us see tonight. They're very stunning and they are actually now on display at the Phillips Gallery if you want a closer look in person. Um, but I love this image of the spiral jetty because we can really take in uh, the huge, you know, uh, large massive pile of rocks that's been shaped into this spiral shape. Um, upon its construction at Roselle Point, which is very obscure, <laughs> not frequently visited prior to uh, location on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. Um, in the uh, year 1970, Smithson uh, asked a Leary construction crew to move um, 6,000 tons of black basalt rock. And in doing so, making this 1,500 feet coil, uh, which winds counterclockwise. Um, now you see it here uh, as it is now uh, sometimes, but not as often. More often we see the spiral jetty like this. Uh, and in the current uh, drought state, the spiral jetty is very much more often um, kind of surrounded by uh, the dry sand or, and just small rock that uh, kind of uh, winds through not only the spiral, but now as it has become more and more decayed, the rocks move and there is more sand in the actual spiral itself. Um, but one thing that really inspired Robert Smithson to choose this location is the lake itself. Uh, it's unique. Uh, it is a terminal basin, so we don't have much water coming in, any water coming in and out of it, and is very much dependent on the rainfall. Uh, and as we know, it's very salty, <laughs> only a second in its levels of salinity to the Dead Sea. And so with that, there's these incredible amounts of mineral deposits and unique uh, types of wildlife there, <laughs> if you can call it that. If you look at the label of the spiral jetty, 
uh, when um, presented in museum exhibitions in photographs, the medium is basalt rock, salt water, and algae. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like as if we're talking mediums of oil paint or, you know, a lithograph, but he uses algae as an important component of this object because it is the algae that really influences a lot of this red color, which was important uh, to different layers of meaning of the spiral jetty. And we'll talk about that more. Um, and this is all in a location that Robert Smithson found uh, in uh, aerial uh, observation. He was looking all around the Great Salt Lake, looking for the right spot that had the right components to him. Um, and he found this unused, uh, inaccessible corner of the lake to be just the right point. And it has now become this pilgrimage destination for many people, um, both in and outside of Utah, who want to experience the spiral jetty. Uh, here's another uh, beautiful photograph uh, by Ron Brown. Here we see this kind of um, decaying oil rigging posts that have been left. So it is not completely untouched by uh, industry. Uh, also, it is near Promontory Point. So there's a museum not too far off. That's where we stop to use the restroom before we make the plunge into the dirt road and onto the um, final point at uh, the spiral jetty. And here you can kind of get a sense for the water levels now as everything is very low, um, but kind of the otherworldly uh, water as the minerals change the different colors from lavender to uh, red, as we saw, to blues, to uh, browns. It is uh, variable depending on the season and even the day as to what the color palette will be when you see the spiral jetty itself. So that is what we are looking at. And let's just land on, on this beautiful image for a minute. So, okay, we can appreciate the formal qualities of the spiral jetty. We see that it's a spiral in a lake and it's massive. So why would we drive? to the middle of nowhere to see that. We've got it right here. Um, and it's really helpful to know the story behind uh, all of this to really understand uh, what this all means. Robert Smithson was born in New Jersey, very much uh, uh, exposed to uh, New York City and a very densely concentrated area as far as population goes. But in his childhood, he writes about having a special cave that as a kid, he felt was his own. And it wasn't something that was curated or prepared by adults. In fact, the adults didn't know where it was. And he writes about how influential having that spot was to him. And I can relate to this. I think kids are naturally drawn to these wild places, uh, which may have, you know, abandoned weird asphalt or bits from the uh, industrial part of town, but also kind of engorged by a natural setting. And that's what he writes about from his earliest childhood days. And Smithson also felt very keenly moved by his experiences in the Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, he liked thinking about time, not in decades or centuries, but rather eons. And he saw himself placed in natural history, in the Earth's history, rather than in uh, this very finite human history. So when he saw himself as an artist, he had some really ambitious aspirations, not to just, you know, make a sculpture about shopping or about Coke bottles. <laughs> he wanted to go all the way into the biggest topics possible. And, and I think 
uh, his final work, this spiral jetty really does get closest to that as he possibly could, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Going back to this slide, I think all, I don't know how many of you has said Jackson Pollock, my kindergartner could do that, right? <laughs> so let's just think through, this is your whirlwind tour through 20th century art, but thinking about what happened to make abstract expressionism, this kind of splattering on a canvas relevant, uh, really matters when we're thinking about the spiral jetty. Okay, so if you go back to art history and the Renaissance and those paintings of things that you actually know what they are, right? <laughs> Portraits and landscapes and uh, religious paintings and history paintings. I think, mo I think that is something we can hold on to, right? We see people, <laughs> we see uh, recognizable subjects. And then something shifted in the 19th century during Impressionism, where not only were there technological advances that changed photography or changed painting, <laughs> I gave it away, photography, which made it so maybe our goal isn't any longer to recreate a scene just to look exactly as it does in real life but maybe our goals in painting can be something else. That was kind of first questioning of, is there another goal that can be attained by a painting other than recreating a likeness? And then moving through artists like Van Gogh and Picasso, they're even pushing further and abstracting more, playing with art as a means to a concept or painting as a way to start a conversation or emote a feeling rather than show a fancy portrait of a rich person who is paying for it, yeah? And so through the 20th century, painting became more and more abstracted as painters said, you know, this subject, like having a story or a symbol or even a, 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 a figure is really distracting to our ultimate goal, which is to express or to achieve a concept. And they, and thinking about it this way is helpful to me. So, you know, I can listen to uh, a piece of classical music and it doesn't have a title that is anything that helps me understand it more. There's an opus and a number <laughs> and a key signature, right? But I can still be very moved. I can emote or I can experience some complexity through different types of classical music, through, through instrumental music. And I don't need someone to say, oh, but this passage is symbolic of uh, the nativity or something, you know what I mean? Like it's something that can be a more, um, what, the, what the abstract expressionists would call a more pure connection because we get out of our, our thoughts so much. And that's actually what art historians love to do is to <laughs> overthink all of it anyway, but it's helpful, right? <laughs> so as this abstraction continues through the early 20th century, Artists take on this notion that truly to rid ourselves of all these distracting elements of art from the past, we need to cling to really pure types of painting that only deal with elements of painting like color and line and shape. And we're going to rid our art of everything else. So that's like really intellectual, right? <laughs> we're all getting a little glaze. And the room in which the artists were participating became small, more and more small, fewer and fewer participants. And it almost became this ivory tower or more appropriate, maybe this cathedral of purity in art. So it's, you know, the art critic Clement Greenberg in the 1950s and 
figures like Jackson Pollock and here's another object, Frank Stella, who are saying like, we really want this pure art, this uh, infallible, this uh, untouched art to be what is in our museums. So that is why we have this minimalism and abstract uh, expressionism. And this became uh, the movement in which the art capital of the world after World War II, uh, all of uh, many European uh, artists moved to New York and this became kind of really the, for Western art, the, the capital and the, the hotbed for um, art uh, and and uh, uh, the dialogue was very much centered in New York. So it's problematic, right? Because like in the 1950s, okay, there were these few people who were very serious about their art. Number one, what what happens if you're the next generation and the generation before you said, this is like the absolute purity and this is the only way we can do art, quite limiting. <laughs> and also, I wasn't around in the 1950s, so I don't know what it was like. But from my observation, this was an age of kind of the first true age of materialism and consumerism in the United States. This is the age of like spam and uh, vacuum cleaners and all sorts of kind of lowbrow disposable stuff that was now being marketed and bought. And we had television and commercials and like howdy doody, right? So like all of this popular culture did not jive at all with what was happening in the art museums. So there was a huge disconnect. And I think the artists were like, we're doing you this favor by giving you this pure art. And everyone else was like, what? No, I have no idea what they're talking about. I will not even bother to participate. And I like to think about what happens next as like someone taking this beautiful vase off of a, a pedestal and just throwing it on the ground and shattering it in a million pieces. That's what I think pop art does in the 1960s and 70s. And no one does it better than Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein. And, and many of those artists were very much doing the same thing, which is saying, okay, you have your precious art museum and we are going to absolutely sully it with our disposable imagery that is now recreated in, you know, a silk screen prints that are enlarged to be this enormous size that was once preserved for like history paintings, right? Lichtenstein's taking one frame of a Dick Tracy comic book and making it the size of a wall. It was never meant to be like this beautiful thing that we go in the museum and venerate. It was to just say, oh, lighten up, stop it. You guys are taking everything way too seriously. And if we are all, you know, living this elevated life where we only um, experience the purity of line and color, then maybe we should paint that way. But guess what's happening? Our lives do not reflect that. Andy Warhol famously said, I would paint a field of cows in a beautiful landscape if that's what I saw. But you know what he's seeing is Campbell soup cans. And it's painful. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Costco shopper, you know, like I'm participating as much as I love to dive deep into this purity of uh, all that art can represent. There's also <laughs> this side of our culture that kind of have to embrace it for being honest. And maybe, maybe I'm the only one, but that's what they do. They give permission and they all of a sudden take this thing that is a tiny pinnacle, this abstract expressionism and this mid-century modernism, and they give permission for everyone to participate again because they are the lowest common denominator <laughs> they're giving us.
<laughs> literally sometimes trash, <laughs> putting it on the museum wall and saying, whatever you want, do whatever you want. So from here, uh, also in the year 1970, uh, there is a growing environmental movement. And Earth Day uh, is celebrated for the first time in 1970. And there is a greater uh, recognition of humans' effect on the Earth and a desire to uh, implement more policies for conservation. So all of this is combining while uh, Robert Smithson is in New York City. Now he doesn't go to, I mean, many of his counterparts in the art world are going to Columbia, like really uh, kind of highfalutin uh, graduate programs on uh, in New York and surrounding areas. Um, but he actually does not uh, go to graduate school or I, I, I'm not sure if he completes college, but he is so intellectual and his library is recorded. I have this fantastic book that if you're really interested in Robert Smithson, this is probably the seminal book written about him, but there's a catalog in the back that is probably 50 printed pages of the books in his library. And his interests range from, uh, let's see, I wrote it down. Literary modernism is a very important topic to him. Physical science, archaeology, anthropology, art history, architectural history, outlandish sci-fi novels, <laughs> folk tales. Um, he was especially interested in the 17th century uh, spiral mazes that would show up in regional parish fairs. So he had a, an extensive uh, library and um, more than uh, his formal education was uh, his deep, long conversations at little dives in New York City with like-minded people. But in his biography, it is noted that he would just deep dive <laughs> in conversation. He loved to talk. He loved to write. And that was an important part uh, of, his, of this project of the Spiral Jetty. Uh, his intention was to have a looping video of him talking about it, um, but it, not in a way that is uh, simplifying it. It's actually <laughs> more art theory, more uh, deep uh, philosophical quandaries rather than resolving anything necessarily. He didn't want to make this easy on anyone. He wanted us to kind of uh, grapple with what the jetty can be and what he saw it as being. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at some of his, just a couple of his earlier works. So you get a sense of who he was as an artist before the spiral jetty. Uh, he started as a painter, but then moved quickly into sculpture. Uh, this is a, a gallery show he did in New York called Traces in 1966. And we see these minimalist shapes as being uh, similar to other modern minimalists uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, really uh, seeking to recreate these, um, you know, very simplified minimalist pure shapes. So he's kind of in, in step with the other uh, artists that came before him in this 1966 moment, but definitely playing with scale and angle and looking at um, these different uh, kind of built pyramids. In 1967, we see him trying something new. Uh, and so one thing I'm, I want to say about that moment when pop art really kind of opened the door for a lot of different artists is it also, it's kind of like there became a multiplicity of art movements all at once. I don't know if you've noticed, but we have like in Western art history, this like very defined eras, like the Renaissance, the Romantic era and the Impressionists, you know, all of these kind of central mainstream movements and then they become shorter and more fractured as we move through the 19th and 20th centuries. 
And when we get to the 1970s, it's like so multifaceted. And not only in uh, the demographics of the artists, now we're seeing people of color who are artists, uh, women are um, more uh, accepted and uh, more active in the art world. We're seeing all sorts of different types of artists, but also now artists experimenting with what art even can be. And for Robert Smithson, he wanted to expand the definition of what was uh, an acceptable space to interact with art. And so he begins in, in, in the 1967 and 68, we see him using like corners. <laughs> Have you ever been like, oh, I wish there was a painting right in the corner. <laughs> no one goes. <laughs> but he felt like, let's use this disenfranchised space to kind of snap us out of our museum glaze and consider this environment that we're standing in. And so he begins by giving us some kind of minimalistic shapes here and then filling them with rocks. And this is where people are like, oh, come on, no, you're giving me boxes of rocks. But let's just remember where we are here in New York City. Have you been to New York City and look closely at your connection to the natural world? They have like, they have trees and they have like grates around the trees, stumps. So you can hardly even see that there's dirt. Like, I wonder if I grew up in New York City, if I'd even know what like a tree root is because they're all submerged underneath the concrete. And can you even see the sun? Like there's so much scaffolding and stuff. And do you, are you even in a mind space where you, care to see the sun or notice the clouds or is there weather is there nature i don't know so in 1968 smithson's starting to say rocks let's think about them let's look at them friends do you remember rocks <laughs> and then moving to what not really i mean this this piece to me rivals the spiral jetty in my mind uh this is red sand red sandstone corner and this was first at museum of modern art in new york and what do we have here <laughs> this makes my students furious i <laughs> hate this one but he set up mirrors in such a way that we're using the corner again and we have sandstones piled up there and it's a big mess right are you itchy just want to get out the broom a little bit and you can see that even the photographer can't quite get out of this shot, right? So pretend like we're all going up to the sandstone corner to look at it. You are absolutely in this corner. So he's saying, okay, fine. You do not have to actually be in the dirt, but I'm going to kind of create this mirror situation so you can imagine what it's like to be in dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so look at yourself in the dirt. Remember that? Do you remember being a kid and you'd see a pile of rocks and what would you do? You'd go climb on it and you'd interact and you'd feel it and you'd have like dirty fingers. And you like get dirt. What if you have bare feet even? That would be like so much interaction with that dirt. Do you remember? And this is red sandstone. And okay, Utahns, we've got like a huge advantage here because we actually are within driving distance of this kind of dirt. But I lived on the East Coast for 10 years. And I remember my son saying to me, he'd never lived in Utah and we, we've moved back since, but I remember him saying to me, mom, have you ever been to the desert? And I was like, oh, why have you never been to the desert? You know, it's special. And I wonder, I mean, I haven't sat down, obviously, I didn't have the chance to talk to Smithson about this, but from my mulling over of this artwork, I wonder if he's in this corner saying, let's just take a minute to remember what's underneath all this concrete. And that for the history of our 
species, we were actively interacting with the earth and the natural features of this planet around, you know, every, every moment of our existence until now. So that's pretty, pretty heavy duty, right? <laughs> really getting us to reconsider our relationship with the natural world. And I love Smithson because he uh, then begins to imagine what would art be like outside the museum? Not a public monument, but like this same kind of goal to invite us to consider our relationship with the natural world. Like, what would that be like? And so he does some funky things. Like he uses industrial lots. This is not like, oh, behold the waterfall. It's like, come see my ramshackle shack that I've half buried in dirt. That's like in some state of entropy and see what happens to things that people build over time. And even just inviting us to purposefully go to an industrial lot, do you know what that's like? Like whenever I see that I have to go get like a weird part for a house project and it's in a place I'm in an industrial lot, I'm always like gearing up for it a little bit. So he's inviting us to disenfranchise spaces that are kind of a mix of abandoned human sites that are now being engulfed by natural, the natural world, which is so interesting. It's uncomfortable, right? To be in, the, it feels a little bit dangerous. So from there, he finds Roselle Point. And from there, he makes his vision possible. He's on a grand scale now. This is his canvas. And like I said, all of these definitions of what pure art is are no longer relevant. And he feels this window open to do what he wants. <laughs> And I, you know, I've, I've read articles where uh, people speculate, could, could the spiral jetty even happen now? Even if it was on private land, wh what kind of bureaucratic involvement would <laughs> be at play, right? Uh, but I, he went, you know, he went through uh, whatever types of limitations he saw, I think it was very loose. I don't think anyone was super worried about this particular part of the lake. Uh, and he was able to then hire a construction team and they made this spiral. So let's take a minute and talk about the spiral. It's an interesting shape, uh, one that uh, surpasses language, perhaps even. Um, one of uh, his colleagues said this about the spiral. He was, uh, this is John Cop Coplins, who was with Smithson during the construction, walked the spiral with him uh, and said, a spiral vectors outward and simultaneously shrinks inward, a shape that circuitously defines itself by entwining space without sealing it off. One enters the spiral jetty backward in time, bearing to the left counterclockwise and comes out forward in time, bearing right clockwise. So, so truly, I mean, I don't know if this is kind of like when you fold your arms the wrong way, like the, the spiral actually goes the way against the way that water usually spirals in the natural world. And some have thought that maybe that's some ancient representation of eternity, but it's, it's, it's a shape that recedes and advances simultaneously. There's an interplay and a contrast between the water and the rock. Uh, we see spirals and petroglyphs of indigenous people and spirals in nature. 
And so it's an ancient shape that has an evolving symbolic importance. So this idea of creating an art object in the earth to actually exist uh, and, and be a, a museum site unto itself is uh, was new in its time, but actually Smithson felt he was continuing traditions from the ancient world, um, such as the Nazca lines in Peru uh, and indigenous people there anciently created these earth mounds. This looks like it's been cut into the earth, but they're actually raised with a, a lighter color stone. And these are, this is an aerial photo of a monkey shape that they made. It's enormous. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact specs on this, but um, they couldn't have seen the finished product from the ground. And so they did it as a religious act uh, and a devotional kind of meditation, but you can see here the spiral here. And they often would use spiral shapes within these larger animal um, formations out of the earth. Uh, and then we see also uh, in Ohio, uh, indigenous folks made uh, the, the serpent mount, which was meant to be another kind of devotional earth um, uh, object that uh, intertwines through uh, the hills of uh, this particular site. So yes, what Robert Smithson was doing was innovative and began this larger earthwork uh, movement, but he felt that he was just connecting to <laughs> his timeline, which is much longer, uh, this kind of eons of time where he, he harkened back to uh, the ancient past. And I even uh, wonder if he did read uh, and was fascinated by pilgrimage routes and uh, mazes. And this is the floor at the cathedral at Chartres. I don't know if this is something he referenced directly, but that whole idea of walking the spiral is something he writes extensively and even kind of has uh, extensive sketches as to imagine those who make this pilgrimage have their final act of visiting the spiral jetty is walking the spiral itself and at kind of having that be a meditative last act of the journey there, which I think is kind of neat. Okay, so we have also this interplay of water. And I really thought that Ron's image here um, captures what Smithson had in mind. Because when he was first looking at this site, the watercolor really is variable, like I said before, but he saw this color of red as being something that he wanted to accompany his earthwork. And I have a quote, um, through the vaporous abstraction of Box Elder County, Utah, <laughs> I beheld a wide expanse of lake whose waters were so bloody a hue as to bring my mind a landscape of unspeakable carnage. Yet at the same time, a voluptuous calm prevailed, a voluminous languor coupled with a foreboding sense of menace produced a gyratory dimension. Okay, so I'm telling you, he's, <laughs> he's really deep into his own mind, right? But he, he saw this as being like a really pale blood. Like nothing could be such a match <laughs> as that color. And he felt like there was a calm and a violence that interplayed with one another at this site. And the spiral with that contrasting uh, stone and, and water had this kind of unsettledness about it. And it really harkens to this sense of what we are historians love to call the sublime. And in the age of romanticism, there was a movement of, it's almost like you think of like the Gothic novel. Well, I don't know if that's so much, but this idea that when you're out in the natural world, there is an awe of the beauty 
but also a sense of the danger that surrounds you? Have you been in a place where you're like, this is amazing and I hope I don't die? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about my safety right now. And I can't, I feel I've never felt so small. Utah is full of those types of experiences, I would say. And for Smithson, that was an essential ingredient of the spiral jetty. So he could take us to, you know, a much easier to access point in the Great Hall. Like we have Antelope Island. We have so many other, in fact, at Antelope Island, have you seen someone's made like a smaller spiral jetty? <laughs> like a little, like, it's kind of like the, uh, Epcot Center, you know, where you have all the little countries, there's like a little spiral jetty you can visit is much easier. So anyway, off topic, but, but he's saying, no, no, no. I want you to go somewhere where it's wild, like the wild that he had in his little cave in New Jersey, like the wild where no one's making sure you're safe. And so sometimes I have friends say, oh, I went to the spiral jetty tons of dead seagulls all around. It was gross. I don't know why anyone would ever go there. And I'm like, but it's the dead seagulls that you're supposed to experience. Like the fact that you can't guarantee that it's going to be this beautiful day. It might be a really wild day, or it might be like biting fly day, <laughs> or it might be serene spring baby cow day. Like we had once where we were just driving and there was like all these baby cows everywhere, but it's not checked. It's not, the idea is to have that feeling of like, no one's in charge. <laughs> no one's making this nice for me. I'm in a place where I am a human and a creature of this world and experiencing it in a very raw way. Uh, so we get that at the spiral jetty. Another essential ingredient that, that Robert Smithson wanted was entropy. He's been interested in entropy his whole life. And so you may notice that the spiral jetty is in, getting in kind of tough shape. <laughs> the rocks continue to spread. There's more and more sand in between. And that definite mound that creates the spiral is becoming more and more or less and less defined. And that's the point. He wants an artwork where nature shows us the, that unraveling into chaos is what we're talking about here. And so if someone kept like piling it all back together, we'd miss the whole point, which is let's, let's intentionally see how nature dissolves anything we do as humans. And so he built this up and he directed, uh, you know, the people who were involved to, to not do make any conservation efforts. And so the artwork lives on in photographs. Um, and interestingly, like we're in such a photo centric world that it's almost like, does it even need to exist? <laughs> I don't know. Like it, it, the photographs now are what it's so widely known for, right? So the, nat the natural history of the spiral jetty, it was completed in 1970. We see Smithson here uh, with a colleague walking the basalt rocks. And then famously, it was submerged in um, 1973. Unfortunately, it was then that Robert Smithson, while scouting out another art site in an airplane uh, was in a crash and tragically died. Um, but uh, the spiral jetty itself was underwater for some time. And then in 2003, reemerged uh, the water levels and uh, came down low enough to expose it again. And when it began to come up, it was white brilliant white as if encrusted with snow and it was of course the salt but it was just like a whole new age of this object and there were I mean from what I was reading like when people began to notice oh it's back like 
groups of people will go and celebrate. Like we're seeing it again. It's the spiral jetty. Um, and now this is just from, I think we went out there during COVID times. I think this is 2021. You can see um, that all that water that was so close is now quite a walk out from the spiral jetty itself. And you can kind of see the um, sand now really uh, separating the rocks, but the, the dry land now is exceptionally beautiful. It's all colors with the minerals. And um, you can see the water here is, oh, is just almost jewel-like uh, in the sunshine. These lavender blue tones is really beautiful. So still a good time, still definitely worth the pilgrimage. But I think Robert Smithson would be pleased uh, with his choice of location now more than ever. He wanted it to be a day away. He wanted us to get out of our uh, routines, to disconnect from our day to day. And little could he anticipate how locked in and, uh, you know, connected to uh, the hustle and bustle we would become. Uh, with the internet and, and uh, phones and all of that. So if you do make the trip, which I highly recommend, uh, it is an adventure by design. It is very much out of the way, but worth a day. Uh, and, and you really can get there to, uh, if you go to Promontory Point, and then there's a dirt road uh, all the way to Roselle Point. And now we have Google Maps, which do eventually, you kind of want to have that on your phone before you take to the dirt road because you lose service. But one thing I think that's really, that's really fun about when Smithson made this all happen and, and created the spiral jetty is he had like, I don't know how many of you remember life pre GPS, but he had instructions like, then you turn at the gate, the second gate though. And then you, you like see the tree and then you turn right. And like these directions are so crazy, but it just reminds me of like high school when someone knows the secret spot that everyone's going to meet at. And you have these like really cool, it's like a bootleg, like crazy thing that everyone's going to see. It kind of feels like that. And he's giving us, we're all invited. No one's left at home. We can all go see this thing um, and experience something where we are so detached from what we would normally be doing. So I definitely recommend it. Bring some bug spray and bring your water shoes that you don't mind if they get really salty. Cause it's like we wore our chacos out there and then they were like, you, they were so stiff. You can like move them cause they're so encrusted with salt. So I recommend bringing shoes you don't mind giving a, a thorough rinse afterwards, but it is a phenomenal day. And it's so wild. Like we went and like I said, we had the baby cow experience. And then as we were leaving, there was like a rattlesnake and it just like coiled up right by our car. And it was so wild. And I was like, Smithson, ah, you know, it's, it's crazy. Uh, but that's what he wants. He wants us to experience that sublime. So this Spiral Jetty is in itself uh, tapping into some topics that go beyond any one of our individual experiences, really the depths of what it means to be a human, what it means to live on this planet, what it means to have a planet. Uh, and I appreciate his ambition the actual point at Roselle Point, he intended to have like, like I said, like a, a little visitor center where you could go down and watch this very intellectual movie and narration, um, but that never was completed. And upon his death, uh, the whole project was uh, then transferred to the hands of his wife, Julie Holt. And she was a fellow artist, sculptor. She was very much uh, doing similar things as Robert Smithson was. And so uh, she continued on and 
eventually uh, had the spiral jetty um, transitioned into the care and stewardship of the DIA Foundation, which is located in Manhattan. Um, but again, they aren't necessarily actively conserving the site, but they do like there were a couple of projects where certain people wanted to put explanatory signs around and and they continue to say no 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 we will remove all that we just want it to be as Robert Smithson intended so uh in the interim as this whole transition is happening uh Julie Holt does her own earthwork sun tunnels uh she is uh framing the sun in the desert. And uh, I, th this is done in 1976. It harkens to, again, kind of this ancient human history. Uh, if you think of uh, ancient monuments, Stonehenge, you know, where they're aligning with the cosmos and giving sight lines for the uh, planetary motion and these kinds of things, that is uh, what. Julie Holt is recreating in this very modernist medium, this cement uh, cylinders. And she got a team of astronomers to help her create holes within the tunnel. So certain uh, times of day and certain times of the year, uh, the sun shines through the tunnels in certain ways. So uh, giving us a focal point and a destination to appreciate the sun uh in a place where it feels so impossibly barren and uninteresting <laughs> but she's saying but did you see what we still have we still have the sun and this cosmic movement that we experience <laughs> every moment we are alive so she continues on asking these big questions I love Walter DeMario's lightning field from 1970, 77. Uh, this is a, another earthwork uh, in New Mexico. Uh, again, all, all of these are inspired by Smithson himself. He's really seen as the father figure of this movement. Um, but uh, Walter DeMario wants us to engage with weather. <laughs> so he finds a place in New Mexico that's known to have frequent lightning storms. And what does he do? He like puts up a regularly uh, uh, measured out lightning rods. So you can go out and experience a lightning storm that's almost curated by these rods. Um, and I checked today, you can still sign up and go down and uh, go to the lightning fields and uh, see these uh, lightning storms here. Um, and you can see there, it's pretty spectacular. If you have the nerve for it, I think I would be a little rattled by that. <laughs> uh, another dynamic and very famous uh, earthwork duo is Jean-Claude and Christo. And here uh, in Florida, they put these huge plastic wrappers around these Florida um, small islands in between resorts. And it kind of reminds us of like pink flamingos in the front yard, you know, that shade of pink. So why, why would you do this? It's so unnecessary, but I assure you, if you ever see a photograph of these without the pink, you will absolutely notice the natural features, the islands themselves, which are always lost in this uh, megaopolis of resort condos otherwise. So do we see the trees? If we don't highlight them with a highlight marker, we may never notice that there's a natural world to be had, right? Same goes for this running fence in the uh, hills along the highways of California. These are some of the most uh, traffic heavy uh, freeways in the LA area. And Jean-Claude and Christo have put a running fence as if to say, you will, know, you will finally see these hills. <laughs> B 
because of the fence and, and the fence uh, kind of spectacularly descends into the ocean at the end of its route. So how do they make money doing this? It's, uh, it's all of the paperwork and the bureaucracy, the photographs and the sketches then go traveling to different museums um, and then they are uh, funded that way. I don't know if any of you remember the gates from 2004. This is a uh, uh, exhibit that uh, was near where I was living at the time. And I love this. It's almost like these, uh, the color is, harkens to like Tibetan monks. And these flags give us kind of this, this meditation pathway through Central Park in February, a time and a place where everyone considers moving and leaving forever. <laughs> Because so, I mean, I'm a Utah and I thought I was hardy and could do winter, but no, the New York area winters is, there's nothing to love about it. And somehow by putting up a sea of flags, Christian and Jean-Claude have invited all of New York to come and enjoy the park in the cruelest weather of the year, which I think is a really great accomplishment. But again, you can see, uh, kind of the different objects that are on display when the actual event is over, it's finite. Um, and another really spectacular uh, earthwork artist is uh, Andy Goldsworthy. Uh, he does art, Christo and Jean-Claude do these wrappings or different kinds of framings of nature that are like two weeks long. And Andy Goldsworthy is even more momentary. He's like that friend you want at camp who can make something cool out of anything he can find. And he makes beautiful, uh, just very temporary objects with his hands. He doesn't use any tools and then captures them in photographs. So we see here different circles and leaves and stones. Aren't they just stunning? Uh, and then he makes these uh, ice sculptures. This is called Icicle Star. Uh, and he even talks about, I mean, just, you can imagine the process. He just talks about breaking off the icicles with his hands and even like licking his finger to hold, put a uh, saliva on to hold it all together. But it's all very visceral and physical with his body to have this deep connection with body and object from the world around him. Um, and then the final, I, I think this is like pure magic, Andy Goldsworthy, uh, did these, uh, this is called Moonlit Path here and in the woods. I don't know how he did this exactly, but these stones glow when the moon is out. I don't know a lot about it, honestly. This is something I want to see in person, but that is the description and what we know. And so he's able to create this moonlit path. You can just imagine it's, it, it kind of has a spectacular natural effect. Uh, and this one, anyway, we're, I want to be sure we have time for a question and answers, but I want to show you a monument that you might have seen en route to California or in Las Vegas. And that's the Se Seven Magic Mountains. Uh, ha have you seen this neon wonder? I haven't, I, I believe it's still of you. Someone who's done the drive recently can let us know if it's still going strong, but it's just this shock of fluorescent boulders. And it has a sense of connection to the indigenous world as um, these kinds of uh, stacked rocks and, and poles hearken to that artistic tradition. But then such an unnatural color for this stone is a connection maybe to what it's like to drive for hours in the wilderness, in the barren, and then see you know the lights of Las Vegas before you. I think it's just kind of showing us maybe another acknowledgement of how outrageous this all is, that this can happen in the middle of Nevada. <laughs> but it has an, an aesthetic beauty to it. I really think it's quite spectacular and fun. Um, focal point on that very boring drive. <laughs> so that is the earthwork tradition that has grown from 
the Spiral Jetty and Robert Smithson. So you can see how influential and important that work is in itself. Um, but I just hope, if anything, um, when you see the Spiral Jetty or you think about the Spiral Jetty, you can understand that it's just an invitation from Robert Smithson to consider yourself beyond the day-to-day, -day, beyond your to-do list, but to really connect on a deeper level to your experience as a human, <laughs> as a creature of this world, as someone who is new and then ages and experiences the entropy that everything in this world does and to um, think about it, to interact with the natural world. All of these invitations are ours to take. And uh, Robert Smithson helps us see that in the Spiral Jetty. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. That was all so fascinating. Um, we have a couple of thank yous in the chat. We have a comment on um, your mirror, the mirror and the rock picture that uh, at first glance, you can't really tell that those are mirrors, right. um, which just makes it that much more dynamic. And then uh, when you were talking about those wild places where um, you're just not quite sure, uh, somebody said that scuba diving also takes you into those areas where, uh, nothing is quite certain. And then a few folks saying that, yes, that last piece from Nevada is still around as of spring of this year. It is still there. Okay. All right. Thanks for the update. <laughs> yes. Um, Becca's lecture tonight ties into our summer reading theme, which is Oceans of Possibilities. So, of course, the Great Salt Lake, um, our inland ocean, as it were. And if any of you are doing the adventure game for summer reading, one of the challenges is to go on an adventure to somewhere new. So I would definitely say that making the trek out to uh, the Spiral Jetty would be an adventure if you have not yet done that. So thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, now is the time to put those in the chat. Uh, we have a little bit of time to answer anything. Um, while we are letting people type, if anybody has a question to type, I was going to ask Becca, um, a couple months ago, I saw an article, I think it was months ago, Time Gets Away, um, about some just like pillars that appeared down in the southern Utah desert. Do you remember that? And do you know anything about it? Okay, that's funny you should ask, because I have just, that is my last slide I forgot about. <laughs> so I'm glad you asked, Minnesota. That was <laughs> well placed. Yes, the U I think it is known as the Utah monolith, right? And it was discovered uh, mysteriously. There's no known artist discovered during the pandemic, I think. And there was a lot of conversation amongst interested people about it being kind of a, a conduit to the aliens or some kind, <laughs> some kind of, uh, uh, you know, remnant of other worlds. But I think what it was, was brilliant, which was bringing some kind of mystery and, um, uh, conversation in this natural space because now we all want to see it right um and uh but and it's you know really in line with what we've been talking about with the spiral jetty being this minimalist sculpture in the middle of an, a natural setting um but from what i read the park rangers removed it and it's in their storage facility so i don't think you can see it anymore but here's a photo Here's what it looked like. I think it's fun. I mean, I, I know we don't want to disrupt the natural setting. So the adult in me says, we don't do that. But the kid in me is like, ooh, it's fun. Love a metal monolith surprise. It's fun. <laughs> and it goes back to what you were saying about the bureaucracy and making sure you have your paperwork in place and um, 
that Robert Smithson did that, you know, regardless of how complicated Correct. it was. And I, I feel like I remember something about the placement of the monolith wasn't necessarily safe and that people right. trying to get to it were, were coming to harm. But um, I also think about textures when I see that, you know, that very smooth copper, very, um, very square lines, very symmetrical in the midst of all of this uh, very rough and wild territory. And the only, you know, the colors echo each other, but the, the texture is very different. So. Right. I know. I love that. I love how it reflects. So you see this, I mean, putting that there changes everything you see in the landscape, right? And you definitely appreciate the sandstone when you see that very polished finish on the monolith. Yeah. I love that. Yes. Yes. But truly uh, these earthwork artists do uh, a you know, accommodate the bureaucratic demands and that is part of the artwork. So we do want to be really mindful about where we're putting stuff and, and want to, it's not just a world full of hidden treasures. We want to make sure it's something that will be safe and, and not harm the environment or other people or animals for sure. Absolutely. So if anybody's out there thinking about their own earthwork that they might want to create, keep to your backyard um, <laughs> and, and go go crazy there. And then otherwise, otherwise there's paperwork. Um, got a lot of thank yous in the chat. Not a lot of questions. I, you really covered that information so thoroughly. So thank you so much, Becca. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for everybody who uh, joined in. Uh, if you came in late, we were recording uh, and you can catch the beginning of what you missed on our website. Uh, we did have one quick question slide in. Uh, two quick questions. Ask how long the spiral jetty is. Do we, have a, do we have a mile distance on that? And then kind of similar, if you were to walk out to the spiral jetty and then walk the jetty, how, about how long does that part take? So my, let me get my scientific specs here. Uh, a coil 1500 feet long. So it's not like you're walking miles and miles. It's probably, so the way that it is now is there's basalt boulders uh, on the side of the road, of the dirt road. So you kind of have to navigate that. And then you walk maybe 500 feet out to the jetty itself you think yeah and uh and and the actual walking the spiral is I mean it's pretty quick so if you if you are concerned if you have some limits as far as um mobility definitely recommend like some trekking poles or something because I think the hardest part is just navigating those boulders to get to the the actual spiral jetty itself It, that makes not, sense. Yeah, it's not like this laborious pilgrimage. It's it's really something that is pretty achievable. Um, looks like Ron was able to join us tonight. He was the photographer that Becca was showcasing for a lot of uh, those pictures. So he says, thanks for showing off his work. Uh, Ron, if you have a site that people can go to to see more of your work, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, we loved... Uh, seeing those beautiful photographs earlier. So a uh, big shout out to Ron Brown for, for the photographs and to Becca Lloyd for her knowledge and expertise and wonderful presentation. So thank you all and uh, everybody have fabulous evenings. Thank you again for joining us here at the County Library. Um, and you can check our calendar for other events similar to this one. We have an adult lecture series that happens uh, alternating Monday, Tuesday evenings, and we have a civic engagement series. Uh, we are neighbors. Sorry, I should know that just off the top of my head. Um, let's be neighbors, not we are neighbors. Let's be neighbors. So if you enjoyed uh, this, we do have uh, other similar programs. So thank you all very much. And again, have wonderful evenings.